Okay, so welcome everybody to the Worst Visual Arts Center. Uh, thank you for joining us for tonight's graduate student talk with Christopher Joshua Benton. Um, so with these gallery talks, we're able to uh, get a new perspective on the current exhibitions we have here at the list. Um, and we have graduate students come in and explore the new our exhibitions through the work that they're doing here at MIT. So tonight we're gathered in Matthew Angelo Harrison's exhibition, Robata. Um, and we have Christopher here joining us from the Art, Culture, and Technology program. Um, Christopher is an artist working in installation, sculpture, film. Um, and he's here to give us a little bit more in insight on his own work and um, some of the themes encountered in this room right now. So without further ado, Christopher. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Elizabeth and uh, the List Art Center team for the invitation. Um, I saw the show myself for the opening, and I briefly uh, met Matthew, and it's a really incredible show. If you haven't gotten a chance to look around, I definitely recommend you to stay after the talk and give it a look. Um, so yeah, I called this presentation Bull in an Archive. I don't know if you know the phrase bull in a china shop. Um, but I, I like this idea of building an archive while simultaneously destroying it. Um, and I was thinking about this idea a lot when sort of um, researching the practice of, of Matthew, um, because he also seems uh, intensely uh, dedicated to this question of, you know, what is an archive? Um, with that in mind, I sort of wanted to make this presentation a little more fun and not super static. Um, with that in mind, I sort of tried to look for parallels between my work and Matthew's work, um, in which case these are sort of the things that I think about in my practice. Um, and it also appears to be things that are present in the practice of Matthew um, in different ways as well. Um, so I think this is an opportunity for you guys to maybe tell me what you're interested in hearing about. Um, so yeah, you can pick uh, one of these eight squares. Um, and I'd love to kind of do a deep dive into my work and also a bit about Matthew. Um, does anyone want to choose something? Uh, raise your hand. Raise your hand. OK, which one do you choose? Uh, power. OK, power. Interesting choice. <laughs> okay, so first I want to maybe talk a bit about how I see power in Matthew's work. Um, Matthew's work engages with power and overt and subtle worries. The first, uh, we can think about the word robot, um, man's dominion over the machine. Matthew offers up the etymological fact that robota is a Czech word meaning forced labor, um, which is where the word robota comes from in, in, in this show. Um, in his resin work and exhibition design, the question of museumification and an institution's power over objects and histories, particularly artifacts that have been stolen or maybe not yet repatriated. Finally, Matthew's work engages with capitalistic power and labor relations, um, extractive, his, extractive histories of stolen people and histories of protests, which is most clearly manifest in the collected protest signs that are encased in resin that you see around you. Um, okay, so I'll talk about one of my projects that also deals with power relations. Um, number five. And since some friends are here, I think this project will be familiar to you. Um, okay, so um, my work also engages in this question of power, um, who has it, who distributes it, um, systems of power, and also just like how systems of labor sort of manifest um, in the sorts of uh, contemporary practices that we see today. Um, so the work I'll share with you uh, first is called The World Was My Garden. Um, this was presented relatively recently. Um, it was mounted twice so far, uh, once at Abu Dhabi Art, uh, commissioned by the curators Till and Sam. And then most recently, a uh, newer version of it was shown at the Venice Biennale uh, last month. 
you can see it now. It's up for a few more days. Um, so in this presentation, I wanted to start each time with a map because place is really important to my work as well as to the work of Matthews. Um, so this is a map of the East African slave trade. Um, so most of us are familiar with the West African slave trade, which bought black bodies uh, from West Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean. Um, what's maybe lesser known is how the black body uh, moved around the Indian Ocean. Um, so if you look at this map, um, you can kind of see people being displaced um, you know, throughout the east. Um, particularly, you see uh, the Gulf region at the top. Um, you see areas as far flung as India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka. Um, so I think it's important to recognize that there's black people here. And they've been here for, for quite, a, quite a long time. Um, if you see the date, it's 1500 to 1900 with the greatest amount of flows of people um, at the end of the, the 19th century. Um, so this project sort of focused on three places. Um, the first one is uh, the Coachella Valley. Um, as you can see here, this is some of the research that I collected. Um, the second one is, is Zanzibar, um, which is the last major slave market in the world. And then the last one is uh, the UAE and, and the Gulf region. So the story that I was really interested in from my research was sort of this very special moment um, around sort of the turn of the 20th century where um, labor markets really sort of coalesced um, in the Gulf region. Um, in particular, what I was focusing on is um, maybe starting in the Gulf the one thing that maybe I didn't mention yet is that I lived in the Emirates for eight years and it sort of uh, influences my thinking. Um, and so if we think about the history of the Emirates, uh, the first two original industries there was uh, date farming and pearl diving. Um, and so both of these industries um, sort of relied on Western appetites. Um, There's a huge rage in France for pearls and globally and there's also a huge desire for uh, dates because there wasn't really candy around this time. And so uh, with this sort of desire for these commodities, there was also a uh, need for greater amounts of labor to sort of um, irrigate you know, the water and you know, tend to dates and you know, dye for pearls, all of it, which is very arduous work. Um, so this sort of coalesced to this moment where uh, there was the peak of the East African slave trade. So the largest amount of movement of people from East Africa to, in particular, the Gulf and just throughout the Indian Ocean was around this time, just for these you know, two commodities. Um, and then so the last part of the story that I was interested in telling in, in this exhibition, and I'll, I'll show you the work soon, is sort of how the date palm ended up in the United States. Um, so I think we're all familiar with the area Palm Springs. Um, named after the sort of, you know, date palm and the abundance of palms in this region. Um, the funny thing is that the palm tree, uh, at least the date-bearing palm tree, isn't indigenous to uh, this area in California. Um, in fact, the only palm that's indigenous to the U.S. is called the Washingtonia. It's a fan palm. It doesn't bear fruit. And so essentially what happened was Americans realized, wow, this fruit is really popular all around the world. Perhaps you can grow it in California and maybe Nevada. It, the climate seems like it's quite uh, perfect for this type of uh, product. And so there, the US Department of Agriculture hired plant explorers to go all around the world, bring back different commodities. Um, so like the beautiful cherry blossoms that we see here are sort of out of that program. Um, but the first thing out of that program that worked successfully was actually the, the date palm which was taken from Oman and Algeria and bought to the US. Um, and so what I'm sort of interested by colliding these two stories in these three geographies is really to share about how these uh, capitalist and extractive forms give us various types of um, diasporic cultural production, but also a really um, strange distortions that happen um, when the date palm arrives in America, it becomes quite sexualized, um, which you'll see in the next few slides. 
Um, so yeah, here's some of the work that was in the show. Um, so I guess sort of the big poetic gesture was this uh, date palm tree that was uh, suspended in the air. It's about six meters tall um, with all of these like chain link. And what I sort of hoped was that it would give people this opportunity to sort of reflect about the sort of circulation and movement that we see when we get to these sort of commodities which are always being like suspended and traded um, and financialized. Um, and again, I think uh, this particular moment that we're talking about, the turn of the 20th century, is really when this globalization of trade um, led to our contemporary moment. Um, here's just a mood photo of someone reflecting, looking. Um, and so, in thinking about this project, I was also really hoping to engage with the idea of the archive. Um, this is a theme I think you'll see a lot in, in Matthew's work. Uh, he uses a lot of archival in material as well as ready-mades. Um, and so, there was a few collaborations in this project that I think really allowed me to um, give voice to certain histories that were maybe a bit subverted. Um, so I worked with the Northwestern University Libraries. Um, they have the largest collection of colonial era African images. Um, and it's funny when you look at the images, some are very beautiful, some are very sad, but you often wonder who took them and why. Um, and so I like this sort of contemplative moment between these two, these two women. Um, but maybe what was most exciting about this collaboration was being able to bring this imagery back to the Gulf. So uh, in my purview, when I was doing my research, there's a few things I was interested in. I was interested in the water, the land, and the people. Um, and like I was sort of saying, my, my, my main sort of mission was maybe this sort of visibility of this uh, hidden history in that, uh, the Emirates is a very young country. Um, it just celebrated its uh, 50th birthday. And um, is a part of this uh, immaturization project of, of identity and nation forming. A lot of this history has sort of been lost. So you see so many people who are of this diasporic moment and yet um, they don't often consider themselves African. They consider themselves to be Emirati. And so what was sort of exciting for me was this sort of opportunity to, to bring back these images that hadn't really been seen before um, in the region. And maybe that some viewers would have this sort of uh, moment of uh, recognition of themselves. Um, here's an image of the show in, in Venice in a reconfigured version. Um, this is a date palm root ball, which carries all the nutrients. Um, and then, yeah, maybe just briefly, I'll go through a few more things. I was really interested in, again, like I said, archives and how images circulate and maybe where did they come from. Um, so this image I used um, in the show in, I think, a really particular way. Um, I made this grocery cart stand. If you look at the back side, you see the, the sort of seductive advertising image. Um, this image is from uh, the Date Festival in California, in Coachella Valley. So you see these American women dressed in this uh, imagined idea of the harm girl. Um, but on the other side, or actually you can't see it here, but on the other side of the image, there's uh, three, three slave men um, who were freed, um, which is actually from this original image here. Um, which is a really strange image because they dressed the slaves in sailor outfits later. Um, nevertheless, yeah, I was interested in really the circulation of like how these images move around and how can I, how can I bring them back? So this is another image that I sort of used in the show as sort of a texture. Um, as most of you guys probably recognize this Brooks image, which is a really famous, um, image that was circulated by abolitionists um, to sort of share how brutal the West African slave trade was and how packed with people uh, a slave ship 
was. Um, but what few people have actually seen is a derivative image that was made about 60 years later. Um, this was made by British abolitionists who wanted to talk about the slave trade of the Indian Ocean, which was you know, still going by the end of the 20th century. I mean, I'm sorry, the, yeah, the end of the 19th century. And so this is a Omani Dow ship. And the illustrators of this wanted to show how, how slaves were packed in that. Um, yeah, and this is me trying to purchase the image. I was really amazed at how expensive it is um, in thinking about archiving. Um, you know, who are the people who hold the archive and then how does that archive spread around and distribute itself? Um, often it's through some sort of capitalist exchange. I think this image was like a hundred bucks, which I think is, is strange to pay for an image of, you know, I don't know, illustrating uh, the abolition of, of slavery. Yeah, and this is, this is an image of it sort of installed or when we were in the process of installing. Um, and then the last thing I'll share of this project, um, maybe I didn't talk about it so much, was sort of what happened when the day ended up in the United States. So um, I worked with an archivist in this project uh, who is a historian of the Coachella Valley, uh, Sarah Seekitz. And she is an incredible woman who is extremely generous in actually telling her own personal testimony. She's from the Coachella Valley herself. Um, and grew up in the region, and she was very kind to sort of share this personal testimony of what it means for her to be an archivist of a place where all the images are of white people, but a lot of the people who give life and grow the dates and tend to, you know, date farms are, are, are Mexican American people like, like herself. Um, and so, yeah, the, the, other video that was in the show was this sort of single channel film where um, Sarah was sort of documenting her own personal work as, as, a, as an archivist, um, producing books about the region, but also this sort of uh, complications she's had um, as someone uh, looking back at her history. And she has this really great moment um, where she talks about finding an image of her grandmother in the local newspaper uh, dressed as a harem girl. Um, her grandmother being this woman here in the center. Um, but sort of the complicated identity um, complexes around it being that you know, her grandmother's Mexican-American. Um, and yet she's not in the archive. Um, and so yeah, this is the first project I wanted to share, um, dealing with the question of power. Um, I guess we have, have time for one more, right? Um, cool, so we'll go back to the matrix. Um, does anyone want to call out something? Anyone have any? Yeah? Diaspora. Ah, okay. Diaspora. Good, good choice. Okay. Um, so for diaspora, I'll share this project. So just to go back to Matthew's work, Um, America's capital systems, exchanges, and orientations are based on its original sin on the black body, building its wealth literally on the backs of forced labor. Matthew builds on this history by connecting the West African slave trade to contemporary capitalistic circulations and modes of labor. Um, so we sort of see that in the two types of uh, material, uh, material culture that he encases in the resin. So if you've seen the show, um, you see that he uses a lot of, um, we'll say West African artifacts that um, may or may not be real, um, which speaks to this sort of labor history in America. But he also uses uh, inscribed protest signs as well as uh, auto car body parts, um, which maybe speaks to more contemporary forms of you know, labor exchanges in the United States particularly situated in Detroit, where, where he and his family are from. Okay, so I'll share with you this project called Chirag's Things. Yeah. So 
Um, here's a map of Satwa, Dubai. Um, this is a neighborhood I lived in for a really long time, um, for, for three years. Um, so if you know Satwa, um, you know it's a very special neighborhood that um, there's Satwa Road, and north of Satwa Road is um, essentially all a Filipino community exclusively. And then uh, south of Satwa Road is, is a community mostly with uh, Indian, Bangladeshi, Pakistani, Afghan um, residents. And so it's a really lovely place with a strong street culture and, and community. Um, this, is, this is my house. This is where I lived when I first moved to Dubai in, in Satwa. Um, and this is another map of the neighborhood. Um, it's sort of a strangely abstract map. But um, as you can see, this is Sheikh Zayed Road. It's the, the main road that goes through the entire city. Um, you can see next to it uh, all the sort of beautiful, lavish, glittering towers. Um, but what makes, I think, this area very strange, um, and maybe this is a better photo, very strange is you have this completely flattened landscape um, of this community in this area, this neighborhood that was built in the 80s, but then behind it you have the city, and it's it's so strange to to be able to see skyscrapers uh, sprout out from the ground. I think in urban areas you often you know can't see um, that depth, uh, and so. I think this, this neighborhood is e extremely unique in how it really visualizes uh, the sort of a gentrification mode of a city in, in change. Um, and you see it in a map like this, which is a map of a development that wasn't going to happen, and now it's back on track. Miras, of course, is one of the big uh, semi-government developers. And so um, putting this all together, um, I often thought about this neighborhood and the question of if this neighborhood is changing so much, um, how can I document it for the future? Um, and what is it that we can keep as a community? Uh, what's the memory that we can hold on to? And also thinking about stories of uh, displacement of, you know, well, where are these people going to go um, once more of this sort of neoliberal development expands uh, into their backyard. And so um, maybe just add one more personal photo. I have a nice personal photo. Do I have a nice personal photo? Ah, uh, maybe I didn't add it. Okay, so to give you a bit more context on the neighborhood, um, one thing that you see a lot if you walk around Satwa is you see a lot of these signs. Um, these signs which sort of speak to um, the precarity of maybe overpriced real estate. And so um, what these signs signify is, is people are looking for roommates in their houses. And so what makes Sato an interesting neighborhood is it essentially consists of a bunch of villas that were originally built for um, Emiratis um, who at some point moved out. And um, now most of these villas are lived in by South Asian, uh, expatriates who um, you know, work in various types of working class labor, like tailors, people who work in restaurants, construction workers, um, the, the people who build the city. And so um, in a city like Dubai, which is uh, beautiful but expensive, uh, if you want to live that close to an urban area, um, a lot of people live in bed spaces. And, one thing that's not in this story, but I think is important to note, is you know even white collar people will live in a bed space, particularly when they first move to the city. Um, and so, what I was always really curious about living in this neighborhood was sort of how my neighbors lived, but I didn't quite have access. And so, my idea was to make a documentary to sort of figure out how I can preserve this contemporary moment, maybe also to be a little bit nosy. I was very curious about how. Um, how, like I said, how my neighbors live. And so um, what I found was a lot of people live in these bed spaces that are actually quite confined. Um, so the most surprising thing I found was um, Shirag's house. And Shirag is, is a friend of mine who I've known for a really long time. 
Um, and he was, is, is one of the stars of, of the documentary that uh, actually we made together um, to where I uh, gave a camera to people in the community so that they could also um, film the neighborhood in their own eyes. Um, I think it's important for people to have the agency to tell their own story. Um, you can find the video on my website if you want to see it. I don't like to lock up art films behind gated walls. Um, and here's a few screenshots of maybe what he captured and what me and my team captured in, in the city, in, in this particular neighborhood. Um, so you see uh, Chirag talking to the camera. Um, you see Chirag's daughter, uh, which I think is a really great moment, sort of visualizing um, the sacrifice that many people make to, to move to a place like, like the Emirates in the Gulf. Um, I, I captured this really great moment um, on the Filipino side of, of the neighborhood of uh, people uh, karaoke with their phone. Um, I have some mixed media stuff of things caught on TikTok. And then I also captured an a Emirati family uh, that I think maybe were originally from Baluchistan. Uh, and here you have some Afghan bakers. So it's really a melting pot, uh, this neighborhood. Um, and so the last thing about this project maybe that I think is important to share um, is it sort of existed across two dimensions. The first one was as a documentary, which I thought was very accessible. But uh, one thing that's really important in my practice when I present works is to really engage in um, spatial forms and installation um, is the generosity to the audience. Uh, I, as a viewer, sometimes don't feel like looking at an art film. And so I think it's important to be able to tell a, a story across different modes and scales. And so uh, with, this was, for me, an important part of the same show. Um, and maybe this form, I was thinking about documentary sculpture. How could we uh, shift the narrative that, of that documentary into a different sort of form? And so, um, when I was working with Chirag, um, I had probably filmed uh, dozens of bed spaces, me and my team. And I remember Chirag telling me, um, he was like, Christopher, like, you've never seen a space like my space. And I was like, sure, I've seen millions of bed spaces, um, or at least dozens. And he was like, trust me, my, my space is, is very confined. And then so when we went to Chirag's space to film, I was really surprised to see that Chirag lived in a room that was about three meters by six, and there was 18 beds in this room. And the way they achieved this was there was, um, there was uh, I guess, bunk beds, and then underneath each bunk bed was a third space to sleep, which was like a mat on the floor. And so Chirag um, actually was someone who had a mat on the floor. And so, um, and Chirag is someone who's completely brilliant, the master tailor of his shop. He's been there for years. He can, he can make anything that you can imagine. And I've pushed him to make things that <laughs> are strange. Um, and what I thought would be maybe nice to sort of like visualize the pressures of living in such a confined space would be, um, to sort of share the material culture of, of that, that is in a place like, like Satwa. Um, and so Shirag and I went on a shopping trip around the neighborhood. Um, and Shirag made a list of all the things that he owned in his space. And so together we tried to find close representations of, of all the things. Um, we got pretty close because when most people arrive, um, to the Emirates um, from, from this community. A lot of times they buy a lot of the things um, on site. And so um, the United Nations has a calculation for overcrowded space. It's, um, the, the, um, it's, it's, the calculation is uh, the, amount of, of the amount of space in a room divided by the amount of people who live in it. And if a person doesn't have over three square meters is considered to be overcrowded, which is a very, uh, it's not a very generous reading of an overcrowded space. Um, and so what we did was we fabricated this Lucite box to the dimensions of what one person's personal space would be um, in a room that was, that had 18 people in it. 
And so the box is roughly one by one meters. Um, so it just barely was able to fit Chirag's things in it. Um, so yeah, this is maybe one of the ways that I think about uh, diaspora is looking at the material culture of, of, of working class people who've migrated from, from one place to another, often for labor opportunities, just, just like I did. And so I think that might be it. Yeah.